Hello. All right, let's see. Hopefully I'm in the right place. I've got, again, my multi, um, <laughs> multiple things going on here because of my um, lack of tech savvy, but hopefully um, we're going to have a great discussion today. And um, as you come on, if you would uh, let me know you're here, where you're from, that would be awesome. Um, we'll give just a, hey, Tracy. And as, uh, along with my um, lack of tech savvy, I also have a little eyesight problem. So I'm going to try to monitor those comments. And if you see me squinting, that's why this eyesight thing is a real, uh, a real bear. So I just start by saying um, thank you again to Ruby and her admin team. Um, what a colossal amount of work they've put in. And it's just an awesome event that all of us um, can participate in and learn from. And I'm, I feel very privileged to, um, to be here sharing, uh, sharing some of my passion with you all. Um, so we've got Tracy. If anyone else is popping in, just say hello, give me a wave. Um, and it looks like I'm just checking my other sources here to make sure I'm live. So, doo -doo -doo. <laughs> You're going to have to bear with me for just a moment. While we, I know there was a little bit of um, confusion for some people about how to access the talks, and I want to make sure that um, everyone has a chance. Hey, Sarah. Oh, oh, now I've got multiple things going. Oh, my goodness. All right. I'll give it just another minute. It's um, lunchtime over here. I don't know where you all are from, but you could be in dinner time or later at night, but we have a beautiful sunny day here in New Hampshire. And um, we've had some 60 degree weather, which is fabulous. That's kind of my thing. I'm so over winter. Um, perhaps you're on the other side of things where you're you're um, you're in the cold, in the in the heat. Um, I would change places with you in a heartbeat. So okay, another yep. Yeah, you're in the UK, 5 p.m. So just about dinner time for you, Sarah. Yeah. And Tracy, five in the UK. Yep. Yeah. So I always think it's it's just awesome that. Um, you know, I have made more connections worldwide than I ever thought imaginable. Um, partly, you know, it's kind of a side benefit of the, I hate to say benefit of the pandemic, but it has really opened things up um, for people who want to make connections, being able to make connections outside of what they normally would. So, all right. So from Ohio, is it Lai? Is that the correct pronunciation for your name? I hope I'm saying that right. All right. So we will get started. Um, we get a few people on. I'm talking today about um, some changes that we can make to our home environment. Lee, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I have one of those last names that people always mispronounce, so um, I like to get it right. Lee, thank you. Um, so some small changes we can make. Um, in and around our home that can have some big payoffs for our our companion animals, our dogs, cats, uh, any animal that we, we might live with inside the home. And of course, when something is a meeting a need of an animal, um, that's going to benefit us as well. So we humans spend, I think, probably a good deal of our time or emotional energy um, attempting to change the behavior of others. But really where our, <clears throat> where our power lies is the changes that we ourselves can make. And when we make changes in the name of caring for another, of course there's a benefit for us. So I had um, put a few pictures in the header of my event and hopefully you all had a chance to take a peek at them, but I'm going to do um, a very, very low-tech review of those because I'm not able to screen share. Oh, and before I dive into all of that, um, hi, I'm Monica. 
<laughs> my business is Barrington Barks and Behavior, and I'm in the New, Ham I'm in New Hampshire, USA. I work primarily with family dogs, and I um, utilize enrichment planning to build a foundation in which everything else is um, works off of. So, um, so here we go. So we are going to dive right in. Hi, Tracy. Okay, so because of my lack of screen sharing, I'm just going to give a little review, and then I'm going to ask um, you all to comment. Alexa, hello. <laughs> all right, so forgive me, but here we go. So one of the pictures that I posted on my event header, you'll remember, was my little friend Oliver, and he is um, visiting me in my home. He's standing on a rug. He is um, sniffing at the little sensory garden I have in my kitchen. Would love it if you could all just shout out um, something that is a benefit to him in this setup, first of all. So I'll give you a minute. And whatever it is that you might think that, you know, he's in front of the sliding glass window, he's standing on a rug, he is um, getting some sensory input, I'd love to hear what you think. And after we get a... Okay, so Joe Weber says height. So Joe, do you mean the height of the object that he is sniffing? using his nose, Tracy McDermott. Okay, he can access, um, Sarah says he can access the sensory garden anytime, awesome free access. Um, it's indoors, so it's available to him, excellent. Um, certainly using his nose, Lee, um, collecting, it's awesome. Let's see. <laughs> he's not on a table, he's actually on a rug. Um, but he would certainly jump on any table that, 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 that he had access to. He was, at that point in time, he was still a puppy and uh, a very active puppy at that. All right, so we have a few. So, and those are all awesome. Yep, using his nose. Uh, let's see, anyone else before I comment on that? All right. So what I would say about that setup for Oliver oh, and Alexa, let me just see here. Do you change essences from time to time? Yeah, and we'll, we will talk about that, Alexa, about what I uh, make available. Okay, Joe Weber says texture. Awesome. And Alexa says, a friend of mine is using essences in the shelter. Excellent. Um, Kelly McDonald, he feels the difference through his paws being on the mat. Correct. Yeah, yeah. He's getting some um, sensory feedback um, by standing on that carpet. Awesome. Oh, you guys are doing awesome. All right. Okay, so you you have definitely um, noticed many of the things that I would point out there. And because my photo, um, you know, holding up my phone isn't the the best, um, I'll just say that um, one thing that is there in that sensory area is a bowl of water. So he feels that, and Kelly says he feels uh, the difference through his paws on the mat. Awesome. Um, so in this little sensory garden, I have a bowl of water right beside it. When dogs are sniffing, they should have access to water um, whenever they want it. So that's another addition there. Um, he is standing on a rug. And we'll get more into flooring a little bit as we go on, but he's got a nice solid surface to stand on. Um, and as a couple of you, um, he's getting some sensory feedback through his feet from the texture of the rug. Um, he's free to go and explore that area. It's accessible to him. And um, 
no pressure. There's, there's no um, right or wrong way for him to do it. He's gathering inf information, not just through um, sniffing in the different smells of these items, but he is also putting his nose into the different textures, so he's gathering information that way. All right. So now I'm going to ask you what could be changed, and I'll hold up that picture once again. I know it's not the best, but what do you think could be changed that would be beneficial to him? And we'll see what everyone has to say. And Alexa, I will get back to your, your question too as we go on. Um, yep, smells. I'm just checking. We can access. Awesome. So I don't know how many of you have um, little scent gardens in your home. Um, during the winter here, it's, <laughs> I feel like there are parts of winter that I like, but there are parts that are just miserable for me. I miss the green. I miss having that life all around me. And I've been, since I got my, um, my little pup, um, and, and prior to that, while fostering dogs, I've always had something accessible to them inside the house that we, we actually all enjoy. Lee, that's awesome. So Lee says that spacing of those items, and that's excellent. Yep, definitely. Yep, Alexa too, more distance of pots, awesome. Beautiful. Sarah, you're on it too about the spacing. More spaced out. Oh my goodness, Tracy, yes. Yep, fabulous. Yeah, that's something that um, I change. I changed. Um, you know, if, if um, you have a little more space between things, then he, the animal, the dog, the, and my cat too, would um, be able to to more thoroughly investigate one thing at a time where it's not all clumped together. I will also say um, that there's a plant light in that picture and um, that could be uh, unpleasant for him to have that plant of the plants. So I can run that plant light at night instead so that there's not that, that glaring light right above his head and the heat produced by it isn't, in, um, isn't a, um, affecting how he explores that area. <clears throat> the other thing is maybe the placement of the items. Um, for some dogs, and this isn't too bad, he's got a couple points of view, but for some dogs um, coming in toward a wall where they're, they're too close to the wall is can be uh, pressured. So I could move that area into um, a different location where he could move all the way around. Um, my house isn't a jungle, but I could certainly do that from time to time so that if there is a dog that's like, oh, that's too close to the wall or um, too tight for me, um, move it into an area where they have a little bit more space. Um, the other thing is that, and it was, yep, being near the window. Yep, it is right near the window. And that can be, um, Tracy, depending on the dog, that could either be um, good or bad. Um, if you have a dog that um, has challenges with being near a window and what's going on outside, um, you could block that window. Um, you could um, move the whole area to a to a quieter location. Yeah, move that whole scent scenting um, garden to a quieter location. That's awesome. That's a good one. The other one that I was going to say is that he's wearing a harness, and you probably couldn't see it in the picture that I held up, but he has tags on his harness. Those tags tended to be kind of noisy, so one thing that you could do is um, either cover the tags with uh, some of the silicone holders so that that jangling isn't constantly happening. Um, it is back from his head, but even having it on his back could be, um, could be distressing or frustrating for him. So I would cover those tags. Or, if safe to do so, 
I would take the harness off so that he can really move around and explore. All right. Did anyone have anything else that they saw in that picture that might you might change if this was in your home? Do, 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 do. And if not, we will go to another. So you might see a common theme here. This is the next one. Remember, this is my little dog, uh, Penelope Potato, Poppy. She is investigating a um, food foraging item that I put out for her. And if you can tell me, first of all, what could be beneficial for her there. Way. Let me just see here. Eight. Yep, Tracy, that's great. Near the window distractions. Yep. Yep. And anything, um, there are some categories of changes that to me are non negotiable, which would include things that are um, physically dangerous to the dog. Um, but many of these other modifications are based on the individual. You might have a dog that is delighted a big uh, a big well lit window, or you might have a dog that hates it. So, as as with any change or anything in the uh, environmental enrichment category, it's dependent on the dog unless it's a safety issue. So, yep, so Joe Weber, food that she's she has access to. Puzzle awesome. Uh, Tracy, puzzle solving, searching, and sniffing. Um, and Stephanie says, scavenging, hunting for food, mental stimulation. Awesome. I'll give one more minute. Okay, so what I, one of the things that stands out to me in that picture is the flooring that she's on. We often forget um, dogs have the same ambulation that we do. They have um, a different texture on their paws and many surfaces in our homes are slippery. And even if you can't see your dog taking big slips, um, they could be doing some muscle tightening and adjusting them to remain stable. So one of the things in, in the picture with Penelope and the food foraging item is that she is on a non-slip surface. And absolutely, she's got the scent, she's got the food, she's solving a puzzle, um, she's searching and sniffing. And one other thing um, is that she is doing it by herself. I'm, I'm there in the room, but she is not in competition with any other animal while she's engaged with this with her head down. So, and I'll just go right on anything that could be added to that to improve this scenario for her. Let's see what people come up with. Mm -hmm. And one of the things was something I had mentioned before in the picture with Oliver. Watching my comments. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Any improvements at all? Um, the other the other thing that's nice in this picture, um, while you're while you're typing and answering that, is that she's totally naked. Um, she does not have a collar with tags hanging that's going to inter interfere, um, no harness to interfere with movement, so she's just, okay. Yep, so Joe Weber says move it, some to move it somewhere enclosed. So possibly if your dog would feel more secure, or your cat if you're doing it, um, to a smaller room with a gate, um, yep, absolutely, and that would be an individual adjustment. 
And Tracy says, could have various items set up for searching. Yep, I could um, from one item to several things. Yep, and Joe, so she, Joe says, um, you know, make it more enclosed so she doesn't feel um, so exposed. So potentially, you know, that's an individual thing if your dog um, is not as comfortable in this open space. Um, certainly move it to a, a quieter location or uh, a room where, pick the room that they love the most. Yep. Um, and Stephanie says it looks like it's outside for some dogs, no pro problem. Um, for others possibly. And that actually, I know that's the poor quality of my photo holding it up to you on my phone. It's actually in my kitchen. Um, it's a kind of a large open room. Um, so those are all fabulous. Um, certainly you make a great point, Stephanie, that um, if you're going to be providing any of these activities for your dog, you absolutely need to do it in a place that they feel um, secure and remember security for a dog is feeling protected from harm. Safety is our job to protect them from harm. So she needs to feel secure so she can use her brain um, and not be um, thinking about what's, what's behind me, what's over my shoulder. Yep, that's awesome. Um, all right, we will try another. And again, because my dog is awesome, here's here's Penelope with a snuffle a snuffle mat, and this one is outside. I don't know how clear that is, but what can you see there that um, is a benefit to her? We'll start with that. Besides the beautiful weather, and I can see green in the back of that picture. I'm like, oh, give me that time back. <laughs> And if anyone, if I took the picture away too quickly and anyone needs to see it again, um, please just ask. I, if we were on a Zoom meeting, I would just be shooting through slides. Um, okay, so what's a benefit to her? Joe Weber says it's at head height. Okay, is it in a box? Um, it's not in a box, Lee, but it is on top of a hassock. Um, so Joe, so Joe, I'm going to come back to yours for just a second. Um, it is actually at her, it is raised, um, chest height. It might be a little bit hard to see from that angle, but yes. And Laura, can you put, can I put it up again? Yes, I can, Laura. <laughs> so here we are. Anyone else? Head height. Um, oh, yes, yes, Tracy. There's a rug. <laughs> There's a rug on the ground. Again, that footing. Um, there could be things on the rug to sniff around on, but she is on a stable surface. And Laura, you're happy to put the pictures up again. And I apologize profusely for my lack of tech for being able to just present them normally. What do you think with that same picture that you might change to benefit from her, for her, to, to be a benefit for her? Excuse me. <laughs> oh, Laura, good. No other animals, pets around. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, no competition. She does not have to give a thought in the world to someone else coming around. Even if, even if um, you know, she, Poppy loves other animals, um, but when you're involved in something, you know, if you're at your computer and you're focusing and someone comes up and uh, just starts talking to you, it can be startling. So it doesn't mean you um, you know, you hate other animals or whatever label we might put there. It's just you're trying to do something and you don't want distractions at that point. Okay. Okay. So Tracy stop slipping. 
and I, I'm going to show you this one more time because you hit the nail on the head there. That lighter blue doo -doo -doo section right here is a yoga mat. <laughs> so I have a hassock, a yoga mat, and then the snuffle mat to keep it from slipping. That's awesome. All right, Alexa. Sorry, I maybe missed something in the beginning. Are these experiences you suggest for family? dogs coping with stress. So Alexa, I'm really talking, we're, we're kind of going through a couple of photos just to get um, a beginning for some changes that we might make in our home, in and around our homes. So I'm showing you some examples of some of the things that we do or I do in my home and we're kind of analyzing them and then looking at what might be beneficial and what could be changed to, to better suit the dog. Um, and I will say that um, most of what I do um, is aimed at promoting calm and reducing stress. My dog has, um, from the age of nine weeks old, she has generalized anxiety. So I am open to um, trying many things that are safe for her to help her maintain um, a good emotional state. So did Alexa let me let me know if that answered your question. Um, and I'll just add to that Alexa that anything that I might do might not be appropriate for your dog. Each dog is an individual. So we what's appropriate for each individual dog by presenting an opportunity and then observing them during that opportunity and then observing their behavior afterwards to see whether actually what we've done is um, considered enrichment and whether it is appropriate for the individual. Okay, so Tracy says, I don't know if it's an improvement. My dogs prefer snuffle mat on the ground. Yep, that's, that's perfect, Tracy. And that goes right back to um, it's all about the individual dog. And what I would say about that, Tracy, is if your dogs prefer the snuffle mat on the ground, put it on the ground. Just make sure that the footing they're on is not slippery. Yeah, that's great. Wonderful, Tracy, when you recognize what your individual dog um, dog's needs are. And you're welcome, uh, Alexa. Okay, so, oh. I am so sorry. Um, I live in the country and I have huge space around us, so I'm more use, um, used to use the outside. Yep. Yep. We spend um, lots and lots of time outside, and I'm going to be talking about some things that you can, um, maybe some changes that you can make outside that would also be beneficial. Um, oh my lord, my vision. And Mio says the mat is a good size so she can reach all over it without getting up. Yeah, and that's a good point. Um, sometimes when we set our dogs up with something, the item is so huge that they're, um, they're craning and stretching and perhaps that dog hasn't learned how to walk around to access something. So if you find that's the case with um, your dog where you've presented something huge to them and they're just straining and they don't want to step on it make it smaller yeah that's a that's a great spot okay so we'll do I think I might have one more of those and then we'll kind of talk a little more in depth okay so <laughs> obsession with my girl so this is Penelope she is um, sniffing at um, a little forager that I made that's attached to a gate that surrounds my side door. And you can tell me what is benefiting her in this scenario. It's funny, when I look back at those pictures, oh my goodness, she was such a cute little thing. She's beautiful now. Um, but you forget, I think, you live with your animal and you forget what they were like 
um, without having that photo record. We're very lucky we live with all this technology and phones and videos. We can fondly look back and kind of gloss over the harder parts of puppyhood. So, and again, Laura, I'm going to hold that up for you one more time just so that you can see on there. So Lara says the height is perfect, and Lee says, can you describe the mat? Uh, it's a little hard. Uh, basically what it is, is it's just a, um, it's full of pockets. It's flat, and it's got, um, I just sewed strips this way, vertically and horizontally, so it has multiple pockets. I don't know if that's... And there is a, um, a company that designs those, those type of things. Um, I'm not sure whether I can name things or not, but uh, pick pocket foragers um, that you can get online. It's, it's, it's my um, DIY. All right. Let's see. So Tracy says sniffing and foraging move up and down on it. Yeah. Um, Joe Weber says it's vertical, so she's learning it's good to look up. That's an interesting spot. Uh, you're, you're welcome, Lee. Okay, and Stephanie says, is there food in it? Yes, there, there is food um, in the pockets. Yeah. So, um, what I like about that setup is uh, a couple of things. Um, we all have doors in our houses. Um, I have an open concept kitchen. People would come to the door and there was no barrier between uh, my dog and that outer outer door. And although she, um, I had to train her to walk out the door not to stay in, I still wanted a little bit of space between someone coming in and her um, coming up to them. So that's the, the, that's the purpose of the gate. And then having that forager attached to the gate um, gives her, excuse me, gives her um, something to do while the door is opening. Um, although I want to give her time to process the person who's coming in and gather information from them, Sometimes um, having a little something to do um, during that door opening can be beneficial. All right. So then I'll ask you this one last, another question on that is what, what should I change? What would I change to benefit her in that scenario? All right, let me just check here. Um, do, do, do. All right, and we're going to check how we're doing for time. Oh, my goodness. So I work with um, many clients who live in open concept homes, and you have to be a little bit creative sometimes if you need to um, do any kind of um, usage of gates and such. Okay, so Stephanie says, my question is, is the gate sturdy? If not, that could turn from a positive, yeah, that's a, it, that could turn from a positive experience to a scary one. That is an excellent observation, Stephanie. Um, you're absolutely right. The gate is attached to, um, you couldn't see it on one side. There's a bench, so it was attached to the bench on one side, and it's butted up against um, a small, uh, a wooden, <laughs> a wooden stove on the other side, which is fairly heavy. But yes, you absolutely need to make sure that um, having that gate there, it's not going to tip over and scare your dog, and then the associations that they make, <clears throat> um, you know could be toward the person, toward the door opening, toward that particular area. So yeah, that's a great spot. 
And Laura says, do all the pockets have something in it? Because I know that with my three dogs, one or two of them would be frantically um, tearing through that. <laughs> so it's not so much about that particular item. Um, and yes, um, and, and sorry, no, there's just a few treats here and there. If you were going to start using something like that with your dog, I would start with it on the floor, one dog only present, and after they've had a meal, I would introduce it so that it's not, um, they're not frantic. It's more of a thinking activity, an exploring activity, a sniffing activity. So I wouldn't put necessarily their meal in it when they're like, yeah, just give me the food, give me the food. So good point, Laura. Um, the other thing that I would change there is that um, she really should be standing on a rug or a runner. Um, again, with her looking up, um, you can, I don't know if you could see, there was a little bit of um, dropping in her back end and she could be feeling a little less than secure on that floor. So. Um, let me just check. Did anyone have any, any more comments on that one? <laughs> okay. Mio. And I, could you, I'm so sorry. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly too. Mio says, is there a risk that, that the dog could eat the pockets? Um, certainly some dogs have an affinity for chewing on material. And if that's the case, for your individual dog, then this is something that would need to be introduced very carefully. Oftentimes what you'll see is if you're introducing um, some sort of a food foraging item, the food is present, so the dog is immediately thinking about um, gathering the food and not so much about consuming the material. Um, but you could be you know, right there with some other higher value treats that you could um, give to the dogs so that they don't start chewing on the material. Um, yeah, and it's it's individual, so not everything that, you know, anyone tells you is appropriate for your dog. You, you need to um, come up with a hypothesis, try it out, um, observe your dog, and then see the result afterwards. So that's a good spot. Yeah, some dog, not everything is appropriate for every dog. They are individuals just like us. So I think I have just one more and then we'll talk a little bit. Now I have a couple more, but I'm not going to do that one. Um, yeah, we'll stop there. Um, I want to talk a little bit more in depth about some of the elements that I mentioned out of each of those. And the first one, um, for me, it's a biggie, um, is flooring in your home. So you may have a, a house that's covered in hardwood floors, um, top to bottom. And I would really, oh, highly strongly suggest that you think about putting in some rugs or runners that don't slip on the floor to help give your dog a little bit more stability. Uh, if you're familiar with canine, canine arthritis management, it's a group on Facebook. Um, they had a recent uh, study that they posted up that um, talked about uh, the development of arthritis and the relationship to dogs being raised on slippery floors. Um, that's an issue. Um, your dog is not designed to be walking on a slippery floor particularly um, stairs. If you have stairs in your home, they should be covered with runners or you can gate the top and the bottom so that the dog is not going to be rushing up and down or you can assist your dog going up or down or train them to go slowly up and down but still have those runners top and bottom. <laughs> so Stephanie, yep, after my own heart. Um, it, it, it's... I, she says, um, it is terrible. My husband asked why I bought so many rugs. Yeah. Um, if you imagine that you were, um, having to live, if you think back to the last icy day outside, um, I walked outside with my dog. I had a coffee cup in my hand. Um, it was agonizing trying to get across the ice. 
um, and I couldn't wait to get back inside where I had sh secure footing. So really something to think about. Um, it is not just an issue for dogs who are afraid to walk on the floor, although there are plenty of dogs that are uncomfortable. They don't want to leave the rug. They don't want to walk on the floor. It's a physical issue. And of course, if you have a physical issue, that affects your emotions. Um, so it's a really easy thing to do. If I showed you a picture of my kitchen right now, I have a variety of rugs, uh, yoga mats, and wherever my dog is is basically going to be, if I'm providing some kind of a, um, a food foraging toy, she's on a stable surface. She's either outside, um, in, on the grass, on, on the driveway, um, you know, wherever it is, she's not on a slippery surface. Um, so Tracy says, yeah, my dog never goes up the... She's just too big to cope with them. Yep, and that's that's actually um, another study, I think it was CAM Advocates as well, um, that stressed the importance of puppies not climbing, going up and down stairs before three months of age. And if you, if you want more information about that, you should certainly go and check them out. They're really awesome. All right, so <laughs> cover up those floors if you can. You know, you don't have to have everything covered, but if you find the path that your dog typically takes and you throw down some rugs, um, it's, it's awesome. It really benefits them in so many ways. So the other thing I talked about um, briefly was the light that was over my little sensory garden for, for Oliver. Um, the best light, I think, for dogs is natural sunlight, but we can't always have that. Um, Joe Weber, you bought a, <laughs> I love that. Joe Weber says she bought a bungalow so that her dogs didn't have to go uh, deal with the stairs. <laughs> um, but if you can't, if you can't change homes, you know, just modify, put those gates up, put those runners up. Um, yeah. Um, so it's something, the lights are something we don't always think about. Uh, sunlight would be best, of course. Um, then next would be um, high quality LED lights. The lower quality LED lights tend to have a strobe effect. We can't see it with our human eye, but it can be perceived by the dogs. And that can really um, make it look like they're living in a fun house. Fluorescent lights have um, an, an even more uh, strong strobe effect. So just something to think about. And not just what the light bulb is, but placed in your house. So if your dog is is constantly looking up at you, and I'm sure you, you know, for any of us that do anything on online, we have ring lights and so on, and they're kind of glaring and, and unpleasant. So if your dog's bed is in a certain place and you've got a big lamp right there shining right down on the dog, maybe it might be a good idea for you to kind of get down on the floor and see what it looks like from your dog's perspective. Could you angle that light a little bit differently so they're not getting um, quiet? Um, just a little modification you can make. Just get down from your dog's perspective, look up, and see what they're seeing. Um, let's see. So sounds, I was going to talk a little bit about that. Um, a lot of us, not, not myself obviously with my low tech, um, have made changes in our homes that um, include all this high tech gadgetry and the noises that come out of some of these, um, some of these items um, can be perceived by dogs and cats but not by us. So it's worth your home and seeing what electronic items and what appliances uh, are giving off these these higher frequencies. You can do a little search online and kind of um, get more in depth on that. But if you have a place in your home where you can turn everything off, like a tech-free zone, maybe it's your living room, um, maybe a quiet room where you can just unplug things and give the dog a break from all of that um, input that we can't perceive, it's kind of worth looking into. Um, I know there have been a lot of studies on music in dogs. I'm just checking my time here. 
benefit of different kinds of music for dogs. I would love to hear what you use and why you use it and what benefit you're hoping for. You've probably all heard of um, music like Through a Dog's Ear or classical music. Okay, so how do you feel about dog specific music and or white noise such as a fan? It's specific to the individual. There are some good studies, um, although we need more studies in that in that um, area and I can put a link up to um, something after the talk where you can look at it a little more closely. What I found interesting interesting were the studies that looked at um, books on tape for dogs and because dogs are a very social species um, it doesn't take that much of a, of a stretch to think that they would um, could potentially be comforted by listening to a human voice um, by listening to human voices. If you're going to use uh, music <clears throat> I would say that's something that you need to try while you're at home to see what effect it has on your individual dog because every dog is different. Um, maybe it's reggae, maybe it's classical and when I say classical there are different types of classical, um, you know, whether it's strings or uh, wind instruments, um, you're going to have to like do a, an enrichment hypothesis. I'm going to try this particular noise. I'll be with my dog so I can kind of keep an eye and see what effect it's having on them. Um, white noise, I would um, trial that when you're there so you can observe your dog and um, I am I have no problem with um, trying to mask outside noises but you want to make sure that what you're using those noises is not also a um, is something unpleasant for the dog um, so you have to try it yeah and then you have to see what your dog's behavior is to see if that's appropriate for your dog I, when I was fostering for many years, um, I used a lot of books on tape because I saw um, a lot of benefit to that. The dogs in my care were uh, laying down more. They were less vocal. Um, but that's my experience. So you would have to try that with your dog. Yeah, and to see um, what's best. Uh, the other thing I would say about uh, noises is that um, sometimes it has to be silent. It's just like us. Some We have sound all around. Sometimes we're blaring our music in the car. Um, but sometimes you just need quiet. And I would encourage that for our animals too. Sometimes they need quiet. They just need some quiet. So, Okay, so Tracy says, oh good not mad leaving the radio on. Yep, yeah, if if your leaving the radio on has a good effect on your dog, then that's working for you. Yep. Yeah. Um, Alexa says my dog's computer because watching videos with dogs at first they react to vocalizations. Yep. Yeah, and that's individual. You know, some some dogs will not learn to habituate to it. Um, they will become sensitized, so that's an individual thing. Um, yeah, I do have Joe Weber says um, my white noise machine is a godsend, and I have several. And I've also um, looked into brown noise, and I'm sorry I can't give you the specific frequency, but that has been suggested as an alternative to white. All right, so we're gonna we are running out of time, and I have like a million other things. We have ten minutes, so smells. I just want to. Um, touch on this one because um, this is kind of all wrapped into toxins in our homes. Um, ah, and Mia says my dogs listen to MP3 books. Awesome. Yeah, I, I really like the audio, audio books. I went through a little period where I listened to all my old favorites from childhood, Charlotte's Web and um, The Secret Garden, and I'm like, oh, this is great. We're all having fun together. Okay. So toxins in the home relating to smells, 
Um, we pour so much into our home, on our bodies, um, onto our dogs, and it's really important that we take a step back and think about what are in those products that we're using between cleaning products, um, personal uh, lotions, deodorant, whatever it might be. Yes, I'm saying deodorant. Um, your dog doesn't have an option about whether they have to breathe that in. I mean, we really need to be conscious of it too. Um, cleaners, laundry detergents, all of that. I, I think it's worth your time to find a good source of um, non-toxic cleaning products, uh, first of all, and I'll just um, make a caveat there that almost, uh, or basically everything can be toxic if the level is too high, including things like water. So I'm talking about specific chemicals that are in our homes, um, including candles, um, plug-ins, uh, perfumes, lotions. So I am connected to a woman on um, Facebook. Her business page is Conscious Bella and I had reached out to her to ask if I could um, just mention her to you. She has on her page a toxin-free master list and although she does have a business selling um, uh, makeup. She is very dedicated to toxin-free products across the board for your home. So it would be worth your while, whatever source you go to, to investigate how you can reduce the toxin load in your home for your dog. The dog doesn't have a choice if you burn a candle. The dog doesn't have a choice if you wear perfume. Um, that's your choice. So you really have to be conscious of what you're putting in dog's environment. If you're going to use something scented, um, I would certainly say that it has to be um, non-toxic. Um, you, you could boil cinnamon and orange peel on the stove if you want to make things smell good, but if you're going to do that, your dog has to have the um, option to get out of that room and away from that smell. So just something to be aware of. If you're laundering your dog's uh, bedding, and you don't have currently um, a toxin-free type of laundry detergent, send it through a second time with no detergent so that you can just reduce the load of um, chemicals that your dog is exposed to. Um, and Joe Weber says Eileen and, whoops, Eileen and Dogs has a blog on different free... She, she has some awesome information. Oh my goodness, yes, she does. And she, Eileen and dogs might have been, um, Eileen Anderson might have been the one that um, had first suggested the brown noise. Kill birds, yes, yep, yep. So you really need to do a little bit of education for yourself. But if you want to just pop over to that Conscious Bella page and just um, search for the toxin free list, you'll find a lot of, a lot of things there. Um, okay. What do, we, what do we have for time? I'm going to run over. Um, let me see if I can just... Do, 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 do. So toxins also... Um, please try to avoid fertilizers in your yard. I know we love our, our grass lawns. I, a couple of years ago, um, switched over to a grass clover lawn um, and it doesn't require um, any kind of um, any kind of dangerous fertilizers. If you have to do something like that, then you need to keep your dog away from that area. Um, you know. Um, do, 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 do. So I talked a little bit about if you're doing an activity with your dog, separate your animals. It's a simple thing you can do. Put a gate between them. Have one other family member take the other animal and do something with them separately. Um, just really nice for that animal that's involved in an activity to just be able to freely do it in a relaxed way. And if possible, have them naked so dang dangling um, uh, tags don't interfere and don't bother them and no harness if it's safe to do so. Um, and then I'm burning through here. Um, I'm not going to get to everything, I'm so sorry. Uh, I'll just mention water. Um, I used to um, kind of poke fun at my sister who 
was obsessed with um, her dog having access to water all the time because she would get really excited when her dog was drinking and say, oh, look, they're drinking. Um, but I certainly appreciate that our animals, dogs, cats, whatever, we have in our homes with us need to have access to water 24-7 and how they're accessing that water is equally important. If you push your water bowl into a corner and for some reason that corner is pressurized to the dog, they're not going to drink enough. So your water containers, and I have my water dishes throughout my house and out in my yard should be comfortably accessible for your dog whenever they feel thirst. Um, the type of container you use, stainless steel has um, gotten some high marks for um, not uh, promoting bacterial growth. However, some dogs are afraid of metal containers, including my own, or she's uncomfortable with it. Silicone has been another um, suggestion ceramic but you're going to be checking your water containers to make sure they're not scratched um, don't have any chips because then bacteria can grow and I would just say um, whenever you take a drink of water think about um, think about your dog's water every time you take a drink of water does my dog have water do my animals have water and just as you're washing your dishes or your your glass for drinking water you should be washing your dogs, preferably with a non-toxic type of cleaner, and if you don't have access to that, you are going to be um, rinsing, 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 so you make sure there's no residue in your dog's water dish, and I, I just can't get everything. we got three minutes, so I'm going to call it. I'm sorry there was more, um, but remember, you know, get that solid uh, non-slip flooring for your for your animals if you can. Um, think about where you place things. Think about um, whether your dog feels pressure in a certain area. Move things out away from the wall if you need to. Get that water out everywhere. Get the gates up. Um, teach your dog how to walk slowly down the stairs or assist them. Um, avoid toxins. Um, do the best you can to keep that toxin load down. Uh, I know, I'm like, I'm scurrying, I'm scurrying. We didn't even get to the harnesses. Um, but, you know, there's so much more. But just whatever little things that you can do to make the experience in your home for your dog um, a better one and improve their wellness, uh, it's really worth it. So I'm going to sign off because I don't want to run into the next presenter. And thank you all so much for, um, for joining in. Um, and yeah, that's it for me. Go enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Thanks so much, guys.